people are second. People settle in. Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and today we are going to hear from Ben Moore from uh, now Charles University, and he will be talking about three coloring via flows. Um, and if you have any questions during the talk, let me know, and I will let that. Be. All right. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, three coloring via flows. Uh, so let's begin. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So it's a it's a coloring talk. So I thought it I, you have to define coloring on the first slide, even though I assume everyone here knows what the coloring is. But nevertheless, I defined it on the first slide. So just in case you don't know what a graph homomorphism is, here it is. It's a map from G to H, so, uh, that such that for every edge in G, it gets mapped to an edge in H. And once you have a definition of graph homomorphism, you can uh, conveniently define coloring. So coloring is just a homomorphism to complete graph on K vertices. And uh, for this talk, depending on how fast we go or how far we get, it might be useful to know what a 2k plus 1k circular coloring is, which is just a homomorphism to the odd cycle on 2k plus 1 vertices. Okay, so that's that's coloring, that's the definition. But in reality, we're going to basically talk about three coloring the entire time. So you can forget about that and just think about three coloring, which I hope everyone knows. And we're going to focus on algorithmic aspects of three coloring. So we're going to be interested in when three coloring is uh, poly time solvable. And if you ask such a question, it's useful to know some, some NP completeness results or some negative results. So probably everyone knows that three coloring is NP complete. Maybe the most surprising thing will be that it, I'm citing Lazo Lovash. I didn't know that Lazo Lovash did this until I made these slides. Supposedly, Lazo Lovash is the person who proved three coloring is NP complete. Okay, but more interestingly, three coloring is also NP complete even for very restricted graph classes. So, like planar graphs of max degree four. And that's pretty uh, bad if you, if you want to prove nice things about three coloring. Uh, if uh, three coloring is hard for planar graphs of max degree four, I mean, that's a very restricted graph class. It kind of seems like maybe three coloring, you're never going to prove some nice theorems about three coloring if class as simple as planar graphs of max degree four uh, is NP complete. But nevertheless, we're going to uh, press forward uh, and completeness results because uh, three coloring is NP complete uh, even when the input graphs are, are triangle free and also have max degree four. So uh, these two results, already say that three coloring is pretty uh, hard uh, and it's hard even for very restrictive graph classes and so it really seems like you shouldn't be able to say much about three color but despite that i'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about three coloring so what are we going to talk about well we're going to talk about coloring graphs on surfaces and when you talk about coloring graphs on surfaces in particular triangle free graphs you should bring up Grotius theorem so Grotius theorem says that triangle-free planar graphs are three colorable, which is maybe surprising if you haven't seen it, especially given these two NP completeness results I just mentioned. So three coloring was NP complete for triangle-free graphs, and it was NP complete for planar graphs. But if I put both of those words together, it turns out all triangle-free planar graphs are three colorable. So in particular, that means that there's a polytime algorithm for three coloring triangle-free planar. The algorithm, I mean, if you're just interested in the decision problem, it's trivial, uh, you just answer yes. <laughs> Are they three colorable? You just say yes. But actually, uh, I don't know a proof of Grotius theorem that doesn't actually find the color. So you, you can find the coloring in like quadratic time or linear time. Uh, it takes a bit more effort to get linear time. 
Okay, so in light of this uh, theorem, we're going to look at some sort of hard generalization of it from an algorithmic perspective. A natural question that you would ask if you were trying to generalize algorithmically. So the natural question is just to take this word planar and try to replace it with something a bit more general. And to do that, the most natural way to do it is just to ask for uh, an algorithm for three coloring triangle free graphs on some surface that isn't the plane. Um, so this is what we're going to focus on for, for most of the talk, the complexity of three coloring triangle free graphs on fixed surfaces. So hopefully uh, it's clear that you can't uh, answer this question positively in such a nice way as Groch's theorem. You can't possibly just say like all of triangle free graphs on some surface are three color more for every surface. Because we already seen this result of Maffray and Priestman, Priestman that three coloring can be complete for triangle free graphs. So in particular, that means there's a bunch of triangle free graphs that uh, have large chromatic numbers. Because you take any no instance, you follow through the reduction, you get, a, you get some no instances, which means they are three color. And every graph embeds on some surface. So uh, any algorithm uh, would have to somehow detect these things, these graphs that aren't through color. So the, the thing you could, uh, could hope for is that there's only minimally many obstructions to, uh, to three coloring a graph on the surface. So then if that were true, uh, you could come up with an algorithm that looks like find the obstructions, uh, and if there's only finally many of them, you just have to develop an algorithm that tests for them, and then that would be a full time algorithm. So this would be the most optimistic way to answer the question I posed positively. Just prove that there's only finally many minimal obstructions to three color triangle for graphs on the surface, and then somehow come up with an algorithm to test for the obstructions. So we're going to look at this for like slide because it's false. So. Uh, Turns out it's false in a very strong sense. So for, uh, for any surface other than the plane, you can find infinitely many graphs which aren't four colorable, which are four colorable, but they're not three colorable and all proper subgraphs are three colorable. So, uh, and these are usually called four critical graphs because it's terrible to say that all the time. It's much shorter to say four critical. So that's what I'll call them from now on. Out. Um, so this basically says that the naive hope I just wrote on the last slide doesn't work. And um, for any surface other than the plane, so it gets hard really quickly. And I'll try to convince you this observation is true, uh, just with one example. So here on the left is uh, the Groch graph, sometimes known as the Milchelsky of C5. And it's, uh, it's well known to be four critical. It's in fact, the smallest triangle free graph, which is, uh, oh, I realize in this, there's a typo. There's infinite, I mean, okay. There's obviously infinite many graphs which embed that are four colorful, but the point is that they're triangle free. I missed the word triangle free, which is very important in the observation. Okay, so the Groch graph is a triangle free four critical graph. And uh, uh, it embeds in every surface other than the plane. So here on uh, the, the right uh, is, a, is an embedding of it on the projective plane. So if you don't know what, how the projective plane works, these A's are really the same vertex, I'm identifying them. B's are the same, C's are the same, D's are the same. So you could check that this graph is, is in fact the Groch graph. Yes, it's an embedding of the projective plane. And uh, if you wanted to find infinitely many, and I knew the Groch graph, and I knew that it was the Milchelsky of C5, all you do is you take the Milchelsky of any larger odd cycle, and then you kind of copy the same embedding and you get infinitely many examples. If you don't know, you could think about it. It's not that important. There's just, it's easy to come up with infinitely many examples. Triangle free four critical graphs on some surface. And I just, I convinced you that it embedded in the projective plane. If I want to convince you it embeds in all surfaces, I have to, other than the plane, I, I have to, show you an embedding in the torus. Here is one. It's not quite as pretty as the previous one, but it is an embedding in the torus, hopefully. Uh, and it is the Groch graph. 
So the Gold's graph embeds in the projective plane of the torus and hence it embeds in every single uh, surface other than the plane. Okay. Uh, and uh, I guess the Milchowski of large odd cycles also embeds in the torus and it also embed in the projective plane. So, so those are, that family gives an example, an infinite family of triangle free graphs which are four critical on any surface. Um, and there's other ones, it's, there's lots. With an algorithm for three coloring triangle free graphs on surfaces, it's gonna be somewhat complicated because there's a lot of graphs that are minimally not, not three colorable. And uh, that, I mean, if, if you've seen this, you might just give up on the question. <laughs> the most obvious way to approach the, uh, the question is, is false. So you might just give up and try to move to an easier question, like go with five graphs, for instance, because you might think, you might stare at these examples for a while and you might see that they have a lot of four cycles. So you could get rid of four cycles and hope things get better. And rather surprisingly, they do. Uh, so Carson Thomason proved uh, that if you're a graph and you have growth of these five and you embed in the torus or projector plane, then you're three colorable. And the example I just showed the Grouch graph shows that the condition is best possible, but it's actually best possible infinitely often. Just in case you don't remember growth being the length of the shortest odd cycle. So graphs with no triangle or four cycle. And okay, so. That's nice. You've got an analog for Grotius theorem on the torus or projector plane for growth five graphs. And uh, Robin Thomas and Brad Walls showed that you can do it a little bit better. So graphs with growth five that have been in the Klein bottle are, are three, three colorable. And then really crazily, Carson Thomason showed that the, the naive hope that I mentioned a couple slides ago is actually true for graphs of growth five on the surface. So there's, there's only finally many four critical graphs of growth, at least five on any fixed surface. And uh, once you have this, it turns out you can devise a polytime algorithm to determine if a graph of growth five that embeds in some surface is three colorable. The algorithm is just you list out all of these obstructions, which you can actually find. And then there is an algorithm to test for specific obstructions. So then you just build a list, you go through all of them, and that's your algorithm, it's pretty simple. This is a crazy theorem. Um, it is even, it, it, even just with results I've mentioned uh, in the talk. Earlier in the talk, I said that three coloring is hard for planar graphs, uh, max degree four. And yet, somehow, Carson Thomason showed that if you, uh, if you go to any surface, as long as you get rid of triangles and four cycles, there just isn't that many obstructions for, for three. So it's rather rather remarkable. Uh, I mean, if that doesn't convince you, uh, in Waterloo, when I was here, I was on a bus in 2018, and a prof in Sino told me this was the nicest theorem he knew. So if the theorem itself can't convince you, maybe a Bruce Richter on a bus telling me that it's the best theorem he knew, maybe that tells you that it's, it's a great theorem. Okay, <laughs> but we were really aiming for, for triangle free graphs, not growth five graphs. So, I mean, if, you, if you've seen these re results, you knew that it was hard, you might just try to work on the projective plane because it's the first case of a surface bigger than a plane and the plane is solved by Grotius theorem. You might try the projective plane first. It turns out, I mean, this doesn't give a three coloring algorithm, but there's a really nice theorem on the projective plane that uh, could give you some hope that there is an algorithm. So this theorem of Young's uh, says that every non-bipartite quadrangulation of the projective plane has chromatic number four. And I do a picture of it. We've already seen the Grotch graph, but the Grotch graph is a non-bipartite projective quadrangulation of the projective plane, in case you didn't know me. So I, I think this theorem is quite counterintuitive uh, because, I mean, especially if you're used to working in the plane, if you're working in the plane, there are no non-bipartite quadrangulations. Uh, so you might not even realize that there are non-bipartite quadrangulations on other surfaces. But even once you know that, it's really weird that they would all have chromatic number four. And why could they have chromatic number three? So it's really a strange theorem. 
uh, but we're not going to go into it. But I encourage you to look at the proof of this theorem if you haven't seen it. It's really nice. It only takes like a page. So it's great. And the reason I brought it up is because uh, it turns out that that characterizes three colorability on the projective plane for triangle free graphs. So Gimbel and Thomson proved that if you're a triangle free graph and you embed in the projective plane, then you're three colorable unless you contain a non bipartite quadrangulation of the projective plane. So that's a really, uh, a really smooth characterization of three colorability. And it gives rise to a polytime algorithm. Uh, for three coloring triangle for graphs on the projective plane. You just have to look for non bipartite quadrangulations. Okay, so that's really nice. And so now at this point in the talk, we've, we've determined, at least through other people's results, that, that girth five coloring graphs on surfaces is always in P for an easy reason. You, if you don't have any girth condition, it's NP complete. And uh, if you're on the projective plane or plane, then and uh, three coloring triangle free graphs is in P for kind of an easy reason. Uh, I don't know if this reason is easy, not my part of quadrangulations, but it's a reason. Okay, so you could just keep going for higher surfaces. And as soon as you get to the torus, it already becomes a little, little tricky. So uh, Zenik Dvojak and uh, Jakob uh, Pekarek, I guess, uh, they, they proved that a triangle free graph which is embedded on the torus is three colorable uh, unless it contains one of 186 subgraph templates as subgraphs. And I, I'm not going to define what a template is because it's not that necessary. The, the real, th what, what you should take away is that it's a, it's a graph. It's basically a graph, but you're allowed to kind of patch in quadrangulations in certain spots. So, uh, on the torus, there's infinitely many four critical graphs from this observation I said. Uh, and this theorem says that, okay, there's infinitely many, but they all have a lot of four, four faces. Basically, there's 186 graphs, except for the fact that I can kind of embed four faces however I want. And so that gives me an infinite framework. But, but effectively, the graphs are mostly looking like quadrangulations that are problems. And uh, that actually sub really surprisingly extends to all surfaces, at least almost. So Zeniak, uh, Dan Krall, and Robin Thomas proved that if you're a triangle free graph on some surface, uh, and it has genus G, and you don't have any non-contractible cycles of length at most four, if you're four critical, so you're minimally not three colorable, then you have very few faces of length bigger than four. So this, this sum being bounded says that you don't have very many faces of length bigger than four. Why? Well, K is a constant. And if I fix the genus, it's just a number. So this is just a number. So then the sum of faces of length at least five is bounded by some number. So this says that up to non-contractible cycles of length minus four, basically four critical graphs or quadrangulations or close to it. Okay. So this is a really strong theorem. It implies this result of Carson Thompson I mentioned earlier. So uh, uh, the fact that there's only finitely many girth five graphs on any surface, uh, four critical graphs on any surface of girth five. Why does it imply that? It implies that because if you have girth five, you definitely don't have any non-contractible cycles of length the most four. And uh, then this sum is actually the sum over all faces. And it says that the sum over all faces is bounded by some number. So that means there's only finite many. Okay, so that's, this is quite strong. And uh, okay, once you have this theorem, you can work a bit harder and you can get a polytime algorithm to determine if triangle free graphs on some surface are three colored. Okay, so at this point, maybe you're really confused about where this talk is going. I said that this question, which, uh, what is the complexity of food coloring triangle for graphs on surfaces? I said that was the question for the talk. Here we are like 20 minutes into the talk. We have a solution by some other people. There's a polytime algorithm. It looks like we can just pack it in and go home and say, okay, we've answered everything, it's great. But there is at least some drawback to this theorem. And the drawback is that the algorithm 
isn't actually that useful in practice. And so what does that mean? It means that there's a gigantic multiplicative constant uh, hidden in the big O notation that basically makes this algorithm not useful if you Um, ben, I don't know if you can hear us. You're frozen for us right now. Your video and audio are not coming through. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. So I assume I was somewhere right here. Uh, something like that, yeah. The slide before. The slide before this one. Right. The last one. I think you cut up on yes there. I cut off here. Yeah, you just mentioned that the algorithm has a has a big multiplicative constant. Okay. So that was I was just talking to myself for a while. I didn't know. This. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, sorry about that. All right, so um, yeah, so the algorithm has a gigantic multiplicative constant that makes it not that useful for in practice. If I coded this and tried to run it, it would be uh, not very good, even for small penis surfaces. And uh, it also has a disadvantage of the algorithm itself is extremely complicated. Uh, these theorem, these two theorems, they take like seven papers, and it's it's uh, it's quite long. I'm not sure exactly how long it uh, long it is, but it's it's like over two hundred and some pages. It's, it, it's quite complicated, and my guess is the number of people who actually understand all of the details is limited to two people. Maybe Senya can do. <laughs> maybe maybe some other people also know, but it's probably pretty limited. So yeah, so. Uh, in light of this, you could ask the question, uh, is there a practical algorithm for three color and triangle free graphs on a fixed surface? Um, and practical should also be polytime. So I want, I want a polytime algorithm, but I also want it to be actually usable. <laughs> this, this is what I want. And ideally, uh, it, it, it simple doesn't have to be that simple. I mean, you can make it like totally tricky, but uh, it would be great if you could, uh, Come up with a relatively simple algorithm that you could also actually use in practice. Okay, great. Um, and in light of the, the theorem uh, that said that uh, three coloring graphs on surfaces uh, basically comes down to near quad regulation. So that I'm defining a near quad regulation as a graph of that has most of its faces being four faces, only a constant number of faces, not a four face. Practical algorithms for three color and near quad regulations of surfaces. Okay, so, so, and again, the practical should also be polytime, but you should actually be able to use it. Uh, I mean, it's not really a well defined thing. It's, uh, but I mean, that's, that's the question. <laughs> but I guess you could ask more precisely for an algorithm with uh, that doesn't have a mass of multiplicative constant. At least in some cases. Okay, so for the second question, it turns out there is some hope. So there's this theorem of uh, of Zeniak and Bernard Dickey, uh, which uh, does it in the plane. So they found an algorithm which decides if a planar graph has a three color, and uh, it turns out this algorithm runs in linear time. Uh, I guess, and it's it, uh, like practical, I guess, on near quadrangulations of the plane. So uh, it's an algorithm you could actually code and, and run uh, in plane. It's not actually that interesting in the plane because we know Grotius theorem. So Grotius theorem already tells us that triangle free graphs are three colorable. Triangle free planar graphs are three colorable. So having an algorithm that runs quickly and for near quadrangulations of the plane is not very exciting, but 
it turns out their algorithm can be extended to decide pre-coloring of, uh, of facial cycles. So by that, I mean, yeah, you can take your planar graph, you fix the outer face, you take a three coloring of it, and uh, there are three coloring on the outer face. Okay, so that that's interesting and not solved by Grotius theorem. And in general, quite surprising because pre-coloring extension is, is even harder than three-coloring. It's hard everywhere for even for very few networks. So it's it's very surprising that we have some algorithms. Okay, but that's just the plane. We kind of want to do it for other surfaces. So Zenia can uh Jakob uh, they did this for the torus. Um, and it's it's very similar algorithm, except you get more technicalities on the torus. Uh, and it is again, it's poly time, but also you could actually use it in practice. And uh, then Yek, John Sebastian, and myself, this on the, on the time. Okay. And that's uh, the state of the art of how to prove these theorems. Um, and really, I'm just going to convince you about this very first one, the planar graph one. The planar graph one is the template for the algorithm and then the other surfaces are kind of um, just getting more annoyances on other surfaces but you still basically want to run the same algorithm you just have to do some more technical rigmarole to get it to work okay so let's see how the planar one works so i mean the talk was titled three coloring via flows so we should probably talk about flows and so this is the time, that's the algorithm. So what is uh, an O0-3 flow? Well, it's a function. Um, the edges of, uh, of the arcs of a director graph onto Z3, that's nowhere zero. So the so every edge doesn't get zero, hence the name nowhere zero. And uh, it's kind of got this anti-symmetry property. So the flow from U to V is equal to the negative of the flow from V to U. And uh, also uh, satisfies the Kirchhoff law. So for every vertex, uh, the outflow uh, plus the inflow is equal to zero. So this is the outflow and this is the inflow. And we're working mod three, but that was just a choice and we could have worked over the integers, it doesn't matter. It turns out also due to tut that you can just, you can just ignore the group and it only matters how many elements you're working with. Okay, so that's flows and we're going to use them. We're also going to use flows in disguise, which are modulo three orientations. So what are those? I give you a graph, a modulo three orientation of the graph is just an orientation such that at every vertex, the in degree minus the out degree is congruent to zero mod three. Sorry, I thought I disconnected again. Hopefully that's not the case. Okay, sorry. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, so that's the modulo three orientation. Um, all right, so, uh, okay, so here's the algorithm. It's just, just quite simple. Um, what we do is we start with a planar triangle free graph. We take the dual, uh, then uh, we try to find a modulo three orientation of the dual, which is what I mean by, so I'll explain what I mean by guessing a modulo three orientation, but we're just going to try to construct a modulo three orientation of the dual. And how we're going to do that is by using max flow min cut. Uh, okay, so this might not really look like a three coloring algorithm, but uh, it is. And so we'll go through and I'll justify why it is, is in fact a three color model and, and what, what it really means. What, what do we mean by guess of the modulo three orientation and stuff? Okay, so why should we take the dual? What are we doing? Well, we're using this theorem of Tut that says that planar graphs have a three coloring uh, if and only if uh, the dual graph has a no or zero three flow. So this is something that probably most people know, um, but here's this very, very sketchy picture 
that just basically gives the proof if you know what's going on, but probably doesn't help if you don't know what's going on. But anyways, I'll try to describe it very briefly. So how do you prove this theorem of Tut? Well, you take your planar graph G, you orient it randomly, doesn't matter, however you do it. And that's this black edge. So the black edge is the original planar graph. And uh, then you come up with some rule uh, on the dual. You say something like, if I go left to right across a, a primal edge, I put an arc from left to right. right. It doesn't really matter how you do it. You could have done it the opposite way. As long as you're consistent and you say something like, if I go left to right, orient left to right, that's fine. And then to get the map, what you do is you take your three coloring and you go something like, okay, if I go left to right across the, the primal edge, I look, However, my, my, my original edge is oriented. I take the head minus the tail and I put that as the flow. And I do that at every edge. Uh, and then I check that I get an OI03 flow. And then in the converse, I just invert the map uh, exactly, except you don't know how to start because it's a flow, but you just pick a color for some vertex and then you can invert the map from there by taking some spanning trees. Not that important. The important part is uh, uh, that there, that if I give you a three coloring of a planar graph, I can actually find a noise of a three flow. And conversely, if I give you a noise of a three flow of a dual graph of a planar graph, I can find a three coloring of the dual of the, so the original. Okay. And more conveniently, uh, Tut proved that uh, uh, you can turn nor zero three flows into modulo three orientation. So a graph has no zero three flow if and only if the graph admits modulo three orientation. And uh, this is also pretty easy. And I'll briefly tell you why it works. Um, uh, it's basically because in an zero three flow, you really only have one value. So you're not allowed to use zeros. And uh, the observation that allows you to reduce from two elements to one is that if I have say an edge with flow value two, I just reverse the value and put one, and the resulting thing will still be a flow, uh, no zero three flow, and then you can do this for every value of two, and you can then have only values one, and then you can check that that's a modulo three orientation, and you can do the, the inverse of that, and you can turn a modulo three orientation into a no zero three flow. Okay, all that was to justify the first two steps of this album. So what, what's happening here? We start with a planar triangle free graph. We want to determine if it's three colorable. We take the dual and now we've changed the problem to finding a NOR zero three flow. But then we just observe that NOR zero three flows and modulo three orientations are the same thing. So we change the problem again to, to modulo three orientations. And that doesn't really seem like it got any easier. In fact, it, it, it really didn't mostly. <laughs> Uh, but it, it turns out, at least in some cases, it will get easier. So we can actually find modulo three orientations using Max Fullman Cartanella. That's what they described. Okay, so what did I mean by guessing a modulo three orientation? So here's how you do that. So to guess a modulo three orientation, you have to know what happens if you actually have a modulo three orientation of a graph. If I give you a graph and it has a modulo three orientation, you can define a function on that, uh, that graph which is just the in degree minus the out degree uh, at each vertex. And then you can observe that this function has three properties. Uh, it will have, uh, it'll be congruent to zero mod three at every vertex. That's the definition of a modulo three orientation. It will have the same parity of every vertex mod two. That's just because every edge is oriented and this beta function is in degree minus out degree. And uh, the absolute value of this function will be bounded by the degree. Again, just because every edge is off. Okay, so guessing a modulo three orientation means picking a function, which I'm going to call a boundary function, on the vertex set of a graph and it maps to the integers. So picking some function which satisfies these three properties. That's what I mean by guessing a modulo three orientation. Side, if there is a module three orientation where this guest function would be the in degree minus out degree at each vertex. I'll do an example soon. So if we want to do that, uh, we need to come up with a graph that we're going to run Max Flohman cut on. 
and it's it's quite simple. So if I give you a graph and I give you some boundary function, then the graph uh, that I'm going to run my transforming cut on is just obtained by adding two new vertices S and T, where I add uh, beta v parallel edges from S of T if the boundary function is positive on this vertex, and beta v parallel edges from T to V if the boundary function is negative on this vertex. And so then the theorem of Zeniak and, and Bernard is that uh, if I give you a, a triangle-free planar graph and it's dual, then the graph is three colorable if and only if there is some boundary function uh, such that this auxiliary graph I just defined on the dual has degree of S edges drawing ST paths and the degree of S equals the degree of T. Okay. So that's the theorem. And from this, you get a fast algorithm for three coloring near quadrangulations of the plane. Because we're, as we'll see, there won't be very many boundary functions. So there will only be very few of them. So that'll be quick. And uh, the finding edges showing paths is quick. So you can, your algorithm can just be try over every boundary function to make this graph and find edges showing paths. And because there won't be very many boundary functions, this will be a fast one. All right. So we're going to do an example of this, and hopefully that will convince you this thing on the strip. So the example will be the proof, and then we'll move on. Okay, so here's the example. It's a graph, it's planar, it's triangle-free, it has a three coloring. I gave a three coloring already. But we want to use the theorem to determine it was three colorable. So if we imagine we didn't know it was three colorable, we're going to use the algorithm to determine that. Okay, so what does the algorithm say? The algorithm says we should, or the theorem says that we should take the dual and then we should find a boundary function. And with this boundary function, we can, should construct this auxiliary graph. And then we should find some edges joint paths in the auxiliary graph. Okay, so here's, here's the entire graph. The blue edges are the dual. So here's this dual graph from my original graph, all, all in blue. I've just picked a boundary function for us. It gives this vertex here zero, it gives this vertex here minus three, it gives this vertex here zero, and it gives this vertex here three. There is other choices, but uh, I just decided to do this one. You would have to do all of them if you were really running the algorithm, but it doesn't matter actually. Well. Okay. So then uh, their theorem says you should check. Uh, oh yeah, so uh, sorry. So then the, you build this auxiliary graph where you just uh, you just add three edges uh, from S to this vertex because this is the only vertex with the boundary function being positive. And then on this vertex, you add three edges to T because it is the uh, only uh, vertex with boundary function negative. Okay, so that's the graph. And now we need to find paths in the graph. And you can use your favorite algorithm to find paths, but I'm just going to tell you here's three paths. There's a green path, purple path, a red path. Okay, so this theorem of Zeniak and Bernard say that if I gave you these three paths with this boundary function, you could just you could just say, okay, I found these three paths. My original graph was three colored. Okay, so but why? So we should convince ourselves that that is in fact uh, a valid conclusion. So what do they do? Well, they want to use these theorems of Tut. They want to say that you can find a modulo three orientation of this graph. And if I could find a modulo three orientation, that would mean I have an over zero three flow. And that would mean I have three color of the original graph. So how do I do that? Well, given the paths, there's only really one option to do. You should orient the paths from S to T. And then you should observe some properties of this partial orientation. So in the partial orientation, this vertex here, uh, it has in degree one and out degree one, which is congruent to zero mod three. Uh, this vertex here has in degree three and out degree zero. So that's congruent to zero mod three. This vertex here has uh, in degree one and out degree one, that's congruent to zero mod three. And this vertex here has out degree three and in degree zero. So that's congruent to zero mod three. 
and by construction, how, how this is defined, if I ever find a degree of S edge, edge disjoint paths from S to T, and I orient these paths from S to T, I will always get a partial orientation where every vertex uh, has in degree minus out degree congruent to zero mod three. And it's not just any zero mod three, it's actually corresponding to the, the values uh, that, I, that I picked in the bound function. Okay, so to finish the proof, all you'd have to do is show that I can extend this partial orientation to the entire graph. Um, and this is really kind of when the, the magical facts happen. So to do that, we just look at this, look at the blue edges left over from the path. So there's two blue edges here, there's two blue edges here. That's, these are even numbers. There's two blue edges here, there's an even number. And there's six blue edges here on this vertex. So that's also an even number. So they're all even numbers. And that's not a coincidence. It turns out if you have these paths, the leftover edges are always forming an Eulerian graph. So they're always, you know, every vertex will always be even. And from that, you can use one of the first theorems people usually use, uh, learn in graph theory, which is that uh, if every vertex is even, you have an Eulerian uh, cycle decomposition. And once you have that, you can just orient all of the edges of the cycle, say clockwise or counterclockwise, and that will extend your orientation to the entire graph. So I, it, it won't be that helpful, but I finished the orientation. So all I did was I found some cycles and I oriented clock, clock, counterclockwise probably, but you could also have done it clockwise. But the real, the point was, is that if I have these paths and I delete them, the resulting graph is Eulerian. So I can always easily extend just by finding cycles and orienting clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, so that's, I wrote that here again, but this is just the entire proof. You find the paths, you orient uh, the paths from S to T, gives you a partial orientation with what you want, this, this module three orientation, and then, Conveniently, after you delete the paths, you have an Eulerian graph, which you can easily work with. Okay. And so that's one direction of the proof, basically as a sketch from an example. Uh, but the other direction is equally easy. If I give you a three coloring of the original graph, you go through the theorems of Tut, you get a modular three orientation, you create the boundary function just by taking in degree minus out degree, and then you just check that there is enough paths. That's not that hard. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the example and that's the, the theorem. So we should convince ourselves that the, the algorithm is quick on um, neural quadrangulations. So the real upside of this algorithm comes from the fact that if I give you any graph and any boundary function, if I look at any vertex of degree four, then the boundary function has to give that vertex value zero. And since we're interested in planar graphs and their duals, that means that if I take start with a four face and I look at the dual, the dual will have degree four, the dual vertex will have degree four. And that means that in any boundary function of the dual for that vertex, it has to get zero. And this is just because uh, basically by the definition of boundary functions, I mean, this zero is gonna be the only value that could possibly fit. And, uh, and that means that this algorithm runs in polynomial time if most of the faces are four faces, or most of the vertices in the dual have to be four, just because there isn't very many uh, possible boundary functions. I mean, they have to give zero to all of the vertices of degree four. So the only choices of boundary functions occur in these other faces. If there's not so many of them, there's just not that many boundary functions. And then you just find your favorite flow algorithm to test for paths. Okay, so that's that. Uh, and uh, right. Okay, so yeah, so as I mentioned, this is not very interesting in planar graphs. I mean, it's a nice algorithm, but there's really no reason to use this algorithm because we already have Grotius theorem. We, we know that triangle free planar graphs are three colorable. And so to make their theorem interesting, they, they, uh, they extended it to pre coloring. And uh, uh, 
yeah, it's the exact same algorithm. You just have to come up with the rule for how to deal with the pre-coloring. And if you do it right, the exact same algorithm I did works. Um, yeah, so I did an example, but I think, I think we're pretty running out of time. So I'm just going to skip it. But anyways, there's a rule for how to do pre-coloring extensions for a single face. And it just, it, it amounts to the same algorithm you just you look for paths, and if you've set it up correctly, it, it just works the same. It's, it's it's quite simple. Okay. So, right. So I also wanted to mention. Uh, so the algorithm I showed you wasn't very interesting for three coloring, but something surprising happens, and that it is e is that it can be extended easily to circular coloring or C two K plus one homomorphisms or two K plus one K circular colorings. Uh, because of this nice theorem of Giger, which says that if a planar graph, a planar graph admits a C2K plus one homomorphism, if and only if the dual graph has a modulo 2K plus one orientation, which is the same thing as a modulo three orientation, except now we have the in degree of every vertex minus the out degree of every vertex is congruent to zero mod 2K plus one. Okay. And I mean, you have to go through the details, but the same algorithm I just showed you works for, for in this case of, of odd cycle homomorphisms, just do the exact same thing. I mean, you just do the exact same thing, everything works out. Uh, okay, you might, you need, I guess, the girth to be larger so that you can actually have a homomorphism because girth is preserved under these homomorphisms. Uh, and the length of the faces that produce small boundary functions is different, but okay. it's really just the same thing, except you're replacing like instances of three with 2K plus one and four becomes 2K plus two and everything works the same. And this is nice because A, this is, this, this is surprising. Uh, and there isn't a Grouch theorem for, for odd cycle homomorphism. So, um, so this is not just like trivial from some, some other theorem. This is actually just kind of a new thing. Yeah, so I, I did want to mention that there is a Grouch conjecture for odd cycle homomorphisms, but it's not known. So the, the algorithm would act, is actually new. And also, even if the conjecture is true, the algorithm is still be interesting. So this conjecture of JJR says that planar graphs of growth 4K admit a homomorphism to an odd cycle of 2K plus one, but it's only known in the case where K equals one, which is triangle free graphs, triangle free planar graphs of three color. Okay, so, and actually it's possible that the from a structural point of view, the algorithm we just proposed could actually be used to tackle this conjecture, but we have to, it's not totally clear. All right, so I only have like a couple minutes left. So I'll just very briefly say what you do to get the results for higher surfaces. Um, so basically, you just want to use the exact same algorithm I presented. You would really like it if I could just set up this dual, run a max form and cut, and only have a few boundary functions on the quadrant interventions. That would be great. But there is a pretty big problem. And the big problem is that the very first step doesn't make sense anymore. And that's Tut's flow coloring duality theorem. So it's not true that if I give you any three coloring of, uh, of a graph on a torus, say, then uh, I just get an over zero three flow and vice versa. And so the part that actually breaks down is not going from three coloring to an over zero three flow. It's it's going from over zero three flows back to colorings. That's the part that, that breaks down, which is, I guess, even worse. Okay, but it turns out that uh, not everything goes wrong. Um, if you look at the proof uh, that Tut gives, actually, I don't know if it is Tut's original proof, but if you look at standard proof of Tut's theorem, then basically you can get a duality theorem. So long as when I find my no zero three flow in the, in the orientable surface, if I can guarantee that along some non-contractible cycles, the flow is kind of correct. So uh, we don't have enough time to really go into it, but basically you, you need to ask for a bit of some extra properties on your NOAA 3 flow. And if you can guarantee them, then you can get the duality. 
Uh, and it turns out that on the Taurus, uh, Zanuck and his PhD student managed to, to do it. Okay. Um, and that only works for orientable surfaces because if you again examine Tat's proof of flow color and duality, uh, at some point he makes a rule based on orientation. So it says something like go left or right, do something. And if you say start saying things like go left or right, do something, non-orientable surfaces, uh, it doesn't work because they're non-orientable. But you can still recover a flow of color and duality theorem, basically just by allowing, um, so on each face, you have your graph, it's embedded in some non-orientable surface. On each face, you just give a local orientation and then you follow through Tut's proof. And you just pretend that the orientation actually is consistent and this will just work, except on some edges, you'll get a contradiction. Some one verse, from one side, it'll say, go left to right, do this. And the other side will say, go left to right. And their left to rights will be the same thing. You'll get a problem. But okay, you just, you just live with that. It's the, the situation you're in now. So <laughs> you get these edges that are uh, in contradiction, but you just allow them and call them negative edges or bidirected edges, and you get a flow color and duality. And then you can just try to do the exact same thing as before. But you have to kind of keep track of these negative edges. It becomes about a bit more technical, but uh, that's fundamentally what you want. You just want to find a flow that will dual even with these negative edges on, on, the, on the surface. And really the trick is actually just to go to an orientable double cover of the surface, which will now be orientable. You can kind of operate there and then go back. And if you keep track of everything correctly, you can actually say something. Okay, I think I'm, I'm over time. It's only a 50 minute talk, right? Uh, you might have frozen there again, then, are you there? Okay. Sorry. I, I think I'm over time already, right? Um, it's running a bit, it's running a bit close. Uh, if you had like the one or two more minutes you wanted to share, you could. Uh, I think we can just, we can just, we can just end. I had some conjectures, but I think we can just, we can just go to the end. So, all right, thanks. Thank you very much for the uh, for the talk. Then, does anyone have any questions either here or in the Zoom chat? Uh, and just unmute yourself if you have questions. Okay. All right. Uh, if there's no questions, let's start again.